Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you I've not seen in person, face to face, it's it's just an absolute pleasure to meet you all. Jeff Corey, nice to see you both again. Yeah. Um, and uh, for everybody here, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm, I'm sure people will continue to trickle in over the next couple minutes, but um, I think most of us are probably here. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, I am Sumam Prabhakar, Editor-in-Chief of Orion, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this gathering of smart, uh, kind, and curious writers thinking together about a, a, a topic that feels increasingly relevant to our attempts to understand ourselves and the world around us. Um, Orion is an ad-free nonprofit space for stories that ask unanswerable questions about how we inhabit our environments, um, stories that bear witness to the mysteries around us and imagine ecosystems overgrown with compassion. If you are here for any of the remarkable people involved in today's conversation, uh, you may also enjoy a subscription to Orion where you'll encounter work by people like Anne Carson, Moss Gay, Robin Kimmerer, and Ursula Le Guin. Uh, if you would like to subscribe, you can do so at a special discounted rate, which um, we'll post here in the chat. Um, this event is presented in collaboration with Arizona State University's Center for Science and the Imagination, which brings together artists, authors, educators, scientists, technologists, and policy thinkers to create inspiring, inclusive, technically grounded visions of the future. Uh, and thanks very, very much to them for their support and enthusiasm. I am so proud to introduce the group we have here today, which includes Merlin Sheldrake, author of a brilliant book called Entangled Life and advisor along with Jane Goodall and Michael Pollan for the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. Um, you've all no doubt seen the photos of him holding a copy of his book replete with fungal growth and a uh, large knife inexplicably on the table before him. Uh, it's like a whole Chekhov story in a single image. Um, but I personally prefer the ones where he's like, attached to an accordion and stuck in the middle of a laundromat somewhere because they show that people like Mushroom have endless depths. Um, highly, highly recommend this book, which I'll post here. Um, we are also joined by Caitlin Smith, a writer and scholar from the Boston area who's studying the history of science at Harvard University. She is the founder of Storied Grounds, a Boston-based venture that delivers outdoor learning experiences and virtual tools that foster a connection to place through folk knowledge and humanist ideas. She previously led events for Outdoor Afro, including Foraging for Acorns in the Spirit of Octavia Butler, an experience she wrote about for Orion last year. She can read here. Um, and we are very happy to have here Jeff Vandermeer, best-selling and award-winning author of many books, including the Southern Reach Trilogy and founder of the Sunshine State Biodiversity Group, a nonprofit devoted to rewilding the landscapes of Northern Florida. Jeff is also a passionate editor, critic, and generally an ambassador for the survival of the oddball and authentic in the world of literature. Um, here is more about him. Our moderator today is Corey Pressman, faculty member of University of Portland's Integrative Health and Wellness Program, scholarly and literary writer and beeswax artist in whose able hands today's conversation will traffic from one fascinating rhizome to the next. Thanks everybody and thanks Corey. I will hand things over to you now. Thank you, thank you so much. Hello panelists. Hi. How is everyone? Good. <laughs> All right. Good. Excellent. So good to see you. So I had the amazing experience in preparing for this of getting to like read your condensed, you know, read your works all at once. 
which I recommend for anybody to do, to take a few weeks and just dive into the three of you. And I, I came out with, um, and I hope it's not naive sounding, but I came out with hope. I came out with, um, you know, hope in a sort of technical sense, not specific expectations for the future or for the present, because it's in expectations that we become disappointed, but more rather sort of a general positive affect hope for the adjacent possibles now that this work is starting to coalesce this kind of what, what I'm thinking of. And let me frame this for a minute, and then I'll give you all a chance to start jamming on it with some specific guiding questions. But maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't, but I see fomenting in your works and the works of others sort of a new naturalism that's starting to appear, a, a naturalism that's being propagated by the new naturalists, let's call them scientists like Merlin and Robin Kimmerer and Paul Stamets, of course, and artists like Jeff Vandermeer and Patty Ann Rogers um, and Lori Palmer and visionaries, general visionaries and scholars like Caitlin Smith and Terrence McKenna. Um, and this is kind of, th this view is causing us to reconsider, realign, reappraise and reimagine what nature is and therefore our place in it. Even saying that, I, I'm, I apologize. English language is forcing me to do that. When I say the, nature and our place in it, immediately separates us from nature, saying there's a thing called nature and then there's a thing called us and we're in it. But I know now from reading enough of you all that that's not accurate per se. We are this nature. And I, I think that's kind of part of this naturalism 2.0 is maybe getting around those problems that that cutting that separates things from each other and us from those things. That naturalism 1.0 um, of, let's say, the 17th century on, um, if that's okay, we can talk about it, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, but let's say 18th century on. For 300 years or so, we've had a naturalism that's been based on uh, categorization and cutting and control and a focus on charismatic and obvious, easily categorized creatures, and it's driven by sort of a capitalistic and colonial imaginary, sees the self as a discrete object, and is really about seeing and commodification. And that was, I guess we can snap for that. Can we snap for the naturalism 1.0? It did something for it. it. It led us to at least allowing you all to step into the uh, step into the breach. But now in your work, which I hope will get more snaps, Merlin, that the naturalism 2.0 is kind of about symbiosis and the self as relational focuses not on just charismatic creatures that are obvi, but you know, marginal and liminal creatures and practices. And it's driven by maybe not commodification, although it might be, and we need to talk about that. We need to be wary of the uh, consumerist octopus maybe that could reach out and consume some of our work. Um, but it's driven not by that, but more by looking for solutions to the puzzle posed by our civilization and its growth, posed by that naturalism 1.0 and an evolving imaginary and maybe has more to do with listening than seeing and more um, that the kind of um, humility that listening implies and the kind of work that Merlin does in um, you know, that's really not just a seeing that kind of naturalism, but really more sensorial um, and Jeff's work. And you know, by the way, I should mention this too, between the three of you, this needs to not be ignored. You're all beautiful writers. Your writing is so compelling and so aesthetically informed. And I want to add that maybe to the new naturalism as sort of a poetic prerogative. Is that okay? Would you cop to that? I think I think beauty's role can't be minimized. It, it, it's such charismatic writing. So maybe you are sort of elements of this new naturalism. And if you think about the former naturalism, 300 years or so, it led us to this. Um, but if there's a new naturalism, what might that lead us to? And that's kind of what I wanna hang this discussion on. Are you all cool with that framing? Great, and I'll give you a chance now to actually kind of address the framing by just asking the first of four guiding questions. And that one just has to do with this moment. And so my question to you all to get started is why fungi and why now? Feel free to popcorn in or I could just make Caitlin start. I'm happy to take a go. Very well, thank you. 
Um, well, thanks, thanks all for being here and thanks for having me. And um, it's great to be part of this conversation. I think there are a few reasons why we're seeing a surge of interest in fungi right now. Um, uh, a kind of braided stream uh, of different causes. Uh, one is that we know more than we did. Technological advances such as those um, like DNA, DNA sequencing, for example, that allows us to work out who's living where just by sequencing the DNA in a pinch of soil. Um, new techniques and new microscopic techniques, um, all sorts of ways that we can extend our reach using technology to know more about the subvisible realms than we did before. Um, I think this is partly what's driving the surge of interest in microbes more generally, not just fungi. I think fungi are part of a broader turn towards the subvisible realms. Um, and that, that's driven in part by technology. We know more, uh, there's more to be excited about, there's more to talk about. Um, and, but I don't think it's just that. I think fungi, for fungi live most of their lives, uh, most fungi live most of their lives as networks, uh, mycelial networks. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in some sense, they embody the basic principle of ecology, the relationships between organisms, the, the connective, um, um, they're like living connective tissue. Uh, I think of the ecolo ecological connective tissue. And so they are, they're good poster organisms for ecological thinking. And there's been a big ecological turn as environmental crises have, wor have worsened. So I think they speak to our time uh, on that front. But also um, they are living networks and we live within um, a network zeitgeist. Network has become a master concept found in all sorts of areas of human endeavor, um, not just those concerned with uh, the digital networks of the World Wide Web uh, and other digital networks, um, but in all sorts of areas of human inquiry, network models are, are to be found. So, so it's somehow also poster organs for network thinking, um, but also they uh, there are so many ways we can partner with fungi to to adapt to life on undamaged planets, and I think um, that has catalyzed a lot of interest in uh, in these organisms and the remarkable things that they can do, um, and potentially things that they can teach us. Um, so these are just a few reasons why I think we're seeing this attention now. And of course, no, not to mention um, all of the painstaking work by astonishing um, fungal scientists. Um, not just doing the work, being brave to do the work, but to talk about it as well. And there are many, many people who have um, played a part in that. So I think we we uh, owe them all a great debt of gratitude. Certainly, I do. Um, so, uh, but to adjust your the framing, um, I I do feel like there's a change of foot uh, at the moment. Um, I do feel like we're shifting somewhat, um, at least within modern scientific um, paradigms. Um, there's a certain porosity, uh, there's a certain stretching at the edges, um, things that weren't straightforward to talk about even 10 years ago are becoming much more straightforward to talk about now. So I think there's a change, but I, I hesitate to use the 1.0, 2.0, just because it makes it seem like these principles of 2.0 that you outline, it makes it seem that they're new. But my sense is actually that they're very old um, and actually a, a, a principles that you'd find in many traditional knowledge systems uh, all over the world. Um, potentially going back a very long way, um, and certainly which you find within even bodies of um, North Atlantic um, academic thought, um, such as those of um, Alfred North Whitehead, a process relational philosopher, and the other organis organicist and thinkers who are um, somewhat marginalized um, by mechanistic um, biology rising to the fore in the mid-20th century. So um, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to make it seem like these are new thoughts. And also the symbiotic, the symbiotic view of life, this is something which has um, been uh, developed by uh, passionate and dedicated researchers who have often had to fight their corners very hard for much of the 20th century. So that's my hesitation with that framing. Um, it feels like we're doing a lot of remembering right now. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure about the 2.0. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll retract that from the comments. I will edit that out. I don't want to imply some kind of linearity. So that's true. And this, the, these ideas and concepts exist um, outside of our civilization and have for a long time. But thank you. That was beautiful. I have a lot of questions and comments about what you just said, but I'd love to hear what everyone else is thinking too. Um, I'd love to jump in. Um, so I really enjoyed listening to your insights, Merlin, um, derived from your work as a scientist. And um, one of the things that I think about 
um, as someone who's not a scientist, but um, is studying the history of science and, and loves to just engage with the natural world in a hands-on way, um, it's just all of the excitement that has been bubbling up around fungi, um, not, um, not only within the scientific realm, but also amongst lay people. And um, one of the primary ways that I enjoy engaging with fungi is as a forager and an herbalist. And one of the one of the things that I think is exciting about the the Renaissance, perhaps in mushroom foraging and even people growing mushrooms in their homes and such, um, is that um, foraging mushrooms in particular offers the opportunity to attune oneself uh, to the landscape where you actually live, um, as opposed to relating to the land, relating to the environment as an abstraction with a capital E. Um, that's one of the, the primary um, things that I think I have gained from working with fungi in this manner. Um, an example I can share from my own practice and life is that um, last year we had an incredible drought in New England where I live and it was so heartbreaking for a number of reasons, including the fact that the fungi, uh, the fruiting bodies were, were quite scarce. Um, the mushrooms were incredibly scarce around here and it was quite sad. Um, but I just went on a walk a few days ago and found so many mushrooms fruiting that are so delicious. And um, it, those kinds of experiences I'm finding are really attuning me to various climactic shifts and various um, concerns that I think scientists and other types of environmentalists have been trying to get the public on board with and trying, trying to get people to care about. But I, I think that when it's this hyper abstract entity that people need to buy into, it's quite difficult. And when people have a, a specific practice they can engage in that um, that is fun and, and also entails some element of enchantment, I think that that practice has the potential to offer a bridge into um, greater engagement with these scientific concepts and collective action around that information. Um, one other thing that I'll say is that um, one thing that I, I find exciting about fungi is also that it's democratically available. Um, so I, I find it so inspiring um, learning from various citizen scientists, if you will, um, who are um, you know, people from all walks of life sharing or creating things with fungi and sharing their insights as they go. I think that's that's really exciting as well. And I would attribute that dimension of the, the fungi, their, their democratic uh, availability and potential as, as part of um, perhaps the uptick in interest in them um, as compared to other forms of life. Thank you. It's so important to remember that sociological dimension of Mushrooms. Um, yeah, so it's it's um it's very uh, interesting to me to hear from people who are more hardwired into the the science, being primarily uh, a fiction writer who has come back into kind of um, the science or the naturalism or the ecology through themes in the fiction, allowing me to have a voice. Um, you know, because of something like Annihilation being successful, ironically enough as a novel, um, but I also come to it from a, a background of having a dad, for example, who's a fire ant researcher who uh, would be investigating things like how poison dart frog enzymes interact with fire ant pheromones. Um, and uh, at some point in my dad's research, I realized that there were certain kinds of science that suggested fictional narrative as well. And so I began seeking out um, those kinds of life forms where the narratives seem to suggest something non-traditional. So that's kind of how I came to kind of as an amateur study fungi and related kinds of organisms because they felt in terms of how it placed them in a fictional context somewhat alien but also underdeveloped in fiction. So you would have you know, a mushroom mentioned in some context where it was horrific or hallucinogenic, but there weren't a whole lot of details. Um, it wasn't really integrated into the narrative. Um, and this realization came to me at the same time that I realized that most non-human life forms were simply part of the landscape in most fiction. So they seemed like underutilized narratives. It seemed like there were all these books being written, novels being written, where 
the backgrounds would come to life if you would only explore what these organisms actually were uh, and that they shouldn't actually be part of the landscape. Um, I think that also applies to plants and just about anything at this point. So um, I came to it from that. Um, and then I just started extrapolating uh, different fungal technologies and other things for some of the books that I wrote, including the, the Ambergris series. So for me, it's something where it seemed like an underdeveloped uh, kind of event horizon for fiction, where I've been you know, thinking about it for a very long time. And then suddenly some of the things, you know, kind of roughly in some of the early books that were extrapolation are things scientists are actually exploring now, like wired networks using organic material and things like that. Um, so it's been fascinating to, to see that. Um, at the same time, it's been fascinating to see that even as there has been this kind of new wave or whatever you want to call it of exploration in this area, I think that that mushrooms have retained an essential, not mystery, but um, complexity that is still fascinating to me, even though I'm kind of jaded about how I use them in, 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 in fiction now, <laughs> having used them so much. Um, and so now, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating to, to read books like Sheldrake's uh, just from a wanting to know more as a naturalist. Mm. This, I want to celebrate for a moment how great it is to have such, um, you know, to have representations from sort of history and sociology and the science and the art aspect. And it shows how a transformation like this requires all of these abilities. It needs the, the, the scientists, um, it needs the historian, and it needs the artist to kind of uncover and show us the significance of all of these things. So thank you for that remembrance. And Towards that, I'd love to hear now, I mean, feel free to talk to each other um, about how all of this might inform a new version of the self, a, a sort of the future of the self, a way of thinking about, you know, the self that we have now is a very, um, you know, non, I'm going to go back to some of Merlin's beautiful words. You talked about porosity and post-organism network thinking, which I think I want to get tattooed on my body somewhere. And so how do we do post-organism network thinking and this kind of porosity and the network zeitgeist um, and that sort of attunement to this aspect of nature, how might that inform a, a different self? And I guess society at the same time. Well, I, I guess I'll just jump in briefly um, uh, and just say that the thing that excites me about it is you know, in fiction or not in fiction, uh, both the metaphysical, metaphorical and reality of what you might call contamination, um, mm -hmm. the way spores spread, um, the way that studying, for me at least, uh, fungi reveals how non-separate we are from the world um, and how we are ourselves, you know, inhabited by other organisms anyway. And I think that this is a really powerful expression, if it can be put in the right words, uh, and I'll just stick to fiction, to show people how connected they are to this world. And then that also feeds into some of the stuff we're doing with our nonprofit, where we are attempting to do messaging and, and narrative that shows just how important bi biodiversity is, you know, in and of itself, but also to human beings um, by showing to some extent, that there is no divide if you really look at how the world works around us. Even just eukaryotically, we're already yeah. symbolic. Um, and so how does that float to the top? Are you asking me or? or no, just or anyone, else? yeah, any of all. And how does this affect your daily life, Merlin? I think there are so many, um, so many levels to this, uh, and it's a question that fascinates me endlessly. You know, I, I spend a lot of time um, enjoying the confusion that it presents, mm -hmm. and um, this is one of the things that I try to explore in Entangled Life: the the levels of confusion, um, disorientation, which I think is healthy. Um, and um, there are so many reasons why disrupting a very neat, untroubled notion of individuality is important, because. Um, to stay first i think that that these notions of individuality which are ultimately fictions because they disregard uh deny um and uh, pretend away 
all of the ways that we are inextricably embedded uh, within fluxes and flows and processes um, that make up the living world. And that, um, that illusion of separation, um, I think, has led us into great trouble. Um, this is something that, that uh, I, I don't think is a, in any way a new thought, but uh, I think is an important way to frame this examination of individuality, because there are good reasons to try and find um, other perspectives here. Um, so, yeah, I think there are lots of ways of thinking. One, one is that, that, that we are um, always engaged in symbiotic relations. We might think about the microbes that live in and on us, um, without which we couldn't grow and behave as, as we do. Um, but we might also think about other, all the other organisms that don't share a body with us, but that we depend on, um, either um, by consuming their bodies in the form of plants we eat, or in the ways that they produce things that we need, like the oxygen produced by um, photosynthetic creatures. Um, and so this, this living with, the being withness, um, I think is, is, a, is a hugely uh, exciting and, and powerful um, thought because it magnifies, it magnifies, certainly it magnifies my perception, it leads me outwards, it leads me to turn outwards um, and feel uh, part of something bigger. Uh, and those are, are on the whole are healthy feelings that, that inspire me uh, and I feel help me to um, grow into um, being a, a more responsible, um, healthy human. So, um, and then there are the ways that we could think about individuality and, and loosening of this, this, these fictions uh, in terms of the uh, fluid exchanges that we are part of. So um, Jack Forbes, the scholar, has a great passage in, in one of his books called Columbus and Other Cannibals, where he, he says, if you cut off my ear, I can still hear. One of my ears, I can still hear. Take out one of my eyes, I can still see. Cut off one of my hands, I can still grasp. But take away the water I need to drink and I'll die. And take, about the air, take away the air I need to breathe and I will die. Um, and it leads you to question, um, you know, how much less a part of you is the water we breathe, uh, water we drink and the air we, we breathe. Um, so this way that we are um, thermodynamically open systems, I think, is, is another important way to, to, to um, another important angle to bring to this question, not just a symbiotic one, but this, uh, the question of the flows and processes. And I think really what's required um, ultimately is um, a change of perspective to think about these associations between um, you know us plural um, all the creatures all the units that make us up and of course those units just keep magnifying down you can have um, small bacteria living in large bacteria um, and big viruses contain smaller viruses uh, often and um, so it's very difficult to draw the line um, around any uh, neatly identifiable unit. But I do think the important thing when thinking about these relationships is not to think about two units, which are then, um, which you can sort of draw schematically or imagine schematically and then connect with a line indicating their relationship. Um, because that presumes that they could exist separately from one another to start with. I think more important is to think about a co-creative relational field uh, between relating organisms in which both create, or however many of them, create each other um, through their interaction. And this relational field is, uh, in some sense, ontologically primary. It's a bit like um, M.C. Escher has that the picture of hands, the drawing hands, the hands drawing right. the hands, drawing the hands. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's, how I, that's the sort of perspective shift I think is, is, is needed. That reminds me of the extended phenotype you were writing about, and that it's, at some point, yeah, if, if we take a looser view of extended phenotype, your phenotype is as big as the entire ecosystem, ultimately. So given that, um, you know, is there a, there is this kind of potential for considering the self as this wider, more dynamic thing. Is there an ethos or an ethics of that? Does that have historical and sociological implications. What is what is that? What is a society like if it's if it if it embraces this? This is um, a question that I've been chewing on a little bit as I've been listening to Merlin and Jeff's um, uh, contributions, Corey. Um, I, I really love this notion of a more expansive self that is ecological and non-local and relational. And I, I think it's incredibly powerful for all kinds of reasons. I think that um, it can help us to reconceptualize our thriving as being not only about us, but about um, inevitably any number of other uh, beings and life forms. And I think that's really exciting uh, for the possibilities that it raises. 
And at the same time, um, to, to speak to another part of your question about historical and sociological currents that lend additional meaning uh, to all of this, I think about, um, at the same time, all of the groups of people um, who have been at various moments in time denied self-possession, whether abstractly or legally, um, mm -hmm. and, and therefore um, what it looks like to hold these things at once. So what it looks like to hold on the one hand, a more expansive conception of self um, that is not owned by the individual and that sort of spreads out into the ecosphere um, while at the same time um, retaining some sort of um, appreciation perhaps or, or space for individual actors uh, such, as, such as they are. Maybe if we're thinking about this really, um, uh, mycologically, maybe we have to dispense with the, the notion of uh, discrete actors, but just for the sake of argument, I think that there's utility in retaining space for us to think about um, individual actors in some sense, um, having a sense of, you know, uh, agency uh, over their their lives or a kind of authority over their own expression. So when I think about this issue of the self and what it looks like to revision it um, as more of an ecological concept, these are some of the tensions that I find myself sitting with. And I feel it's quite paradoxical. I'm not quite sure where it leads me, but those are some immediate thoughts that I have. Oh, you're feeling some of that healthy disorientation. I'm enjoying the confusion, as Merlin put it. I really enjoyed that phrase. <laughs> Titillating, isn't it? It's so exciting. It feels like suddenly it's a good time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, and the, the thing is that um, I'm in the fortunate position as a fiction writer of not having to resolve any of those impulses in narrative. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, you know, in a way, what I do is, is frivolous, uh, but it also, you know, I can't actually present all of that in a narrative uh, without having to, to reach a conclusion, so to speak. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't call that frivolity, though. I, I take your work very seriously. I would like to be a mushroom dweller. That's my retirement. Wait, <laughs> I think so. We'll see. We'll talk about it off offline. So, Jeff, given your um, you know your ability, your, your frivolity of positing futures, I wonder if you could lead us in a talk of. Let's imagine we've gotten past this; that it's a few hundred years hence. Yeah. And there are statues of Caitlin and Merlin in various cities, and we're in that world. In um, one context. And uh, well, I'm curious what if we if I'm sorry, Merlin, I'm going to go back to the 1.0, 2.0 because that's just where I'm at right now. That that 1.0 created the civilization we have now, or contributed to it, plus consumerism and the empty self and all of those things. But now, so that was 300 years. So now let's jump 300 years hence. And say that we got through, we threaded the needle, and this connected, porous self took hold as a guiding metaphor. What might the world be like? Um, you know, it's a, it's actually kind of a tough question for me because what I really like to do in fiction is portray the psychological reality of an unusual situation. So I don't really extrapolate in the usual way. I mean, I, I will, like in the Ambergris books, you know, have these technologies that then are kind of like constricted and also um, enhanced or whatever by both human history and natural history and some fusion between between them. But, um, you know, I, I would actually just go back to uh, the present in the sense that there are so many things that we are dismantling, like just, for example, here in Florida, that are natural systems that help us that part of what that future looks like is simply not dismantling things that we're dismantling now. Like in Tallahassee, we are basically uh, clear-cutting forests that's there in floodplains to absorb stormwater, to give a very you know, basic example. Um, so the first step for any future is to, to begin to get to a point that literally in Tallahassee would have been the planning that was in place in the 70s and the yeah. understanding of how the natural world helps the built environment at that time. And then you would add in the layers of what we now can do in terms of 
for example, maybe building materials that are not as harsh uh, in terms of how they interact with the world. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not always convinced that we need to get to this utopian vision so much as we've forgotten, and also some of the things that Merlin mentioned in terms of we've forgotten systems uh, mm -hmm. well before, uh, you know, the current times that we're already doing these things. We've so forgotten it's, it's people that had information even though they're still here. <laughs> We're just, it's just not the majority thing that's happening. Uh, so, you know, you, you'd look to the past first <laughs> and then you would, you would build your future. Um, and from a fiction point of view, that history is never going to leave you. It is always going to still have an effect on whatever that future is. Um, but then you also have the perception of that future to deal with. There's a graphic of a very steel city with lawns that a lot of people use as an example of a, ut a utopian future that to me looks like a dystopia. It sounds so like So there's also the perception. And, and you know, Merlin was getting to this idea of the invisible becoming visible. You know, if there was some, some way, you know, so there's this also this communication mechanism that's, that's part of getting to that future. So, so I don't really have a, a good answer for you. I, I, you know, maybe the other panelists have a better answer. But, but that, that, lack, that lack of clarity is also part of that healthy disorientation. And I'm also not fishing for a utopia per se. Mm -hmm. There'll be new confusions. Um, you know, suffering is our lot. Oh, sure. so down with that. But I'm, I'm just curious, given this talk about new ways of thinking about the self, if that future will go beyond just the same capital con consumerist paradigm, but just with mushroom bricks instead of stone bricks. Right, so and, and that's what we're seeing with the extractive quality of clean energy right now in some cases with like lithium mines, you know, taking out endangered wildflowers, um, you know, uh, and, and this idea that, that if we just get enough electric vehicles on the road that we'll be fine. So yeah, that, that's definitely a, a mode of thinking that I, I don't think works uh, for right. us. Right, and this paradigm that we're discussing could, should it become foregrounded more, could start informing more more holistic solutions. I don't know, what's your take on this, folks? Historians are good at the future. As I think of the more um, expansive conception of self um, that's informed by uh, mycological understanding taking hold in the future, um, one idea that I have is that, um, just from my own work as a naturalist and educator, is that um, I hope that I, I would hope that um, one of the consequences of that would be that people perhaps become more empowered to um, derive information from a wider array of places than they may do currently in, say, within the educational system. Um, so one thing that I do currently is that I, I take people out into the field and um, we talk about various, um, various life forms that we encounter. And I also invite people who attend my events to try to just use their intuition and cultivate embodied knowledge um, of the life forms that we're engaging with. And um, I think that's that's a really powerful practice um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, I think that um, reorienting our educational system so that um, it's not solely focused on abstract learning um, and only learning from, um, you know, experts and complementing what can be learned from experts with um, one's own insights um, that are derived from the more than human world and our bodies within that world, I think has the potential to be really transformative. Um, so I'm excited by by that possibility. And uh, I've been really uh, inspired by the work of David Abram, who I think writes about this in his books, including The Spell of the Sensuous, and um, talks about um, how we have fallen under what he terms the spell of spelling um, and just the way in which um, the written word has has perhaps eclipsed other other um, modes of signification or, or other other sources of insight and speech that arise from all directions from across the more than human world and from our own animal bodies as he might put it um, and I just find that really exciting so I, I like to envision a future in which education might be one of the sites that is transformed by this more expansive notion of self in which we're deriving knowledge from 
multiple places and multiple voices. You kind of solve it that way. That is, I, I'm reaching for this future because it's fun, but there's also a present that can help lead us to this. Because I said in the beginning, I'm, uh, there's no expectations. It's just hope that I have now. And I think that hope shines brighter when this this um, gets worked into the education system and actually becomes experienced. Um, and you know, how, how might we evangelize this? That's very exciting as an educator. Mm. Dr. Sheldrick. I'm thinking of, um, I mean, there's such a, just a vast possibility space. Um, I mean, there's so many, um, I get very, I get kind of vertigo when I think about all, all of the many ways that are um, to, to be, to imagine, to create, uh, and all of the many ways that we, um, in the present moment, if you think about the present as being um, the outcome of numberless past decisions, whether they be human decisions or decisions with, made by other creatures in their way, um, um, in response to um, a kind of current, a torrent of, uh, of decisions before that. Um, and then we are in the present moment in this tension between the numberless past decisions and the numberless uh, possible futures. And this is a kind of intense place to be. So that's what I'm feeling. Yes. But um, the, yeah. um, so yes, I guess, um, I think what, if we really take it on board, um, if, they, if we really take on board, I think a number of these things we've been talking about, which I think are things that humans have in the past really taken on board. They have really been brought up within systems and cultures in which these things were just the way that one thought, the way that one interacted, the one that we, the way that one um, built um, new technologies and relationships and um, and cultural uh, innovations and um, uh, and societal possibilities. That the, the ways that we um, value. Um, and organize could be really very different um, to how they are today. Um, so I like to think about all the different ways that the different experiments in living that there might be. Um, there's a book called The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro, and I really enjoyed this book because it talked um, about the so many ways that humans have organized, um, been played, um, imagined in the past. And there's like some kind of a crisis of imagination right now uh, where we are living in a, in a, a world where there seem to be so few possible futures. Um, but if you look at the past using anthropological and archaeological evidence, there are so many ways for humans to be humans. Um, and I like thinking about that. Um, I like thinking about a future in which there are many ways for humans to be humans, all going on at once, you know, a kind of um, bustling, diverse um, place where, um, where novelty can be incubated and, um, and value can be sheltered um, and all sorts of... Um, experiments in living and experiments in being um and that mirrors in some way the, the bustling diversity of a, of a healthy ecosystem uh, or, or mm. a, a, an unscarred living world um so that's just one thought there, there are several others exciting i it's it's good to, to remind me that every cultural schema comes with its own sort of realism its dose of this is how it's always been this is how it will always be um and that's just i, I believe maybe i'm just a natural part of having culture as a homo sapiens that if it doesn't feel like it's real then you won't adhere to it but it's a imaginary act that comes with some kind of neurological complement of and this is how it's always been and this is how it will always be but maybe the work of this group and this whole situation we're talking about can loosen that a little bit and allow us to be a little more experimental and i think we can handle it and i like i do appreciate the vertigo you're getting that is my happiest space really to be that confused and excited that kind of hope um but then you need the caitlin's of the world to help us maybe i don't know if i'm giving you this role um i'm not going to give it to jeff of grounding us and finding ways to insert it into um into the education system and into the ethos the way those things naturally happen um to be the adult in the room but something amazing could, could come out of that um or not and we always have to be aware of i don't want to bring us down but, and I was kind of worried about this, just even reading your work, Merlin, about, you know, make, Ikea making packaging with mycelial uh, materials, which is exciting. But at the same time, the problem is that the volume of that, um, I don't want to get sued by Ikea, the volume of consumerism is the issue, not the packaging. Um, so I still feel like we need a deeper Vandermeer-esque exploration of futures and psychological realities we have is that okay 
You gonna let me say that? Right on. We have, uh, you can step in at any time, by the way. I have no authority here. I'm just here to be the adult in the room, strangely. Um, we have a really practical question from the audience now that we've been so highfalutin and philosophical, which I am enjoying. But here's a question um, that might be relevant from Kelly Lovell. As we move toward homesteading and farm life, some of us are making that move. What role do you believe fungi will play in that transition? And bringing us down. I think a, a huge, a huge role for anyone who is um, attempting to cultivate the soil in order to cultivate plants. Um, there's no way to to separate that process from from fungi and, and the things that they do. Fungi are great enablers. Um, fungi create soil in many senses. They um, they hold soil together. They uh, are living bridges between photosynthetic um, plants and um, the underground realms. Um, of the soil and the many, many, many creatures that live in these very sophisticated soil food webs. So if you're cultivating plants, you're cultivating fungi. Um, if you're eating plants, you're eating fungi. Um, and um, so I would say, yeah, central. So if you were to think about fungi and you were to learn about fungi, then I think that there's all sorts of um, positive things that can happen because we tend to, um, oh, what we're blind to, um, tends to come and bite us somehow. So um, to enter into a homesteading process and not being blind to fungi um, would be the way that I would uh, approach it myself. It would save a lot of surprises down the line. And in a similar practical um, vein, there's a question for you, Jeff, from another Jeff, um, from Jeff Weisner. What sorts of fungi do you see around your home in Florida and have fungi changed in the course of your rewilding the property? It's a very uh, good question because here in North Florida, we're in this incredibly rich biodiverse zone where, you know, any time of year, basically, you walk outside your house and, and the fungi is invisible to you because there's so much of it. Um, I once actually uh, had a flat tire left my car in the driveway, opened the trunk after two months, and there were... Uh, Puff, some kind of puff fungi in there that, that exploded their spores when I opened the trunk. Um, so it's kind of unavoidable, but it then becomes invisible. Uh, but in our new yard on the edge of this ravine, uh, where we're thankful to be in this situation where we're 10 minutes from the capital, but it's so incredibly wild, um, there's been no disruption of this soil in the backyard for anything, no commercial fertilizer, nothing. And we have the most uh, amazing selection of lion's mane mushrooms you'll ever find in your life. The most amazing uh, chanterelle collection. Um, there's a ton of different uh, hen of the woods, I believe. So these are all common things, but they're in such profusion. Uh, but then they're also used by so much wildlife that we tend to, to leave those there. I mean, when you've seen a mushroom with a little bite out of it that's from box turtle, you, you, you just tend to leave the stuff alone. Yeah. Um, I would say point. that I can't really tell that there is a difference since uh, the rewilding, which was simply that we replaced a bunch of invasives with the kind of native plants that you would find in a in ravine in, in, in a more wilderness setting in, in, um, in North Florida. Um, but just simply that we already had 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 a wealth of them, and that again, unfortunately, becomes slightly invisible to you. Although the lion's mane, of course, I I'm always very very attuned to when it pops up. I mean, there was one that was like twice the size of my head, which I just could not believe. It was you name it ridiculous. You give that a pet name. So yeah. there's uh, there's something forming now that a realization. You know, we again we've been talking about the sort of future of the self, which is very for, you know, vertigo inducing and, and beautiful, but then we're also, Caitlin's bringing us back to this needs to be kind of practically seeded or uh, spored into our universe now. And so I'm seeing things like um, just how we treat our gardens and kind of homesteading vibrations can really help people directly understand that. And then I wonder if there, and, and there's also things like micro remediation, which are very practical uses of this that help bring, all you have to do is bring people closer to mycelium and the mycelium can do the teaching. So these are things that can bring peace, people closer to it is by having a new attitude towards the natural spaces around you, things like um, micro remediation. And then also I wonder, do any of you know, any in the audience too, and forgive me for my ignorance, is there a children's book about this? Is there a nighttime story about this sitch 
Does anyone know? There are some children's nonfiction books about fungi. So, you know, introductions to fungi and their lifestyles and um, what they do and how they live and the different kinds. Um, I'm thinking of um, this one called Fungarium. Um, and there's also one um, by Lynn Body, and I forget its name, but it's uh, it's um, it's a fungal nonfiction book. There are also fiction books. There's a book, and um, one I read, I can't actually remember its name, about a mycorrhizal fungus meeting a tree root and oh. having a kind of whole you know, life underground. Um, I can't remember its name, but I, th I I've met a couple of people who are thinking along these lines, um, and I, I certainly think there's a lot of room for this kind of tale that opens up young minds um to what seem like fantastical stories um but really okay. are um the places that the places that it's healthy to imagine um I, I i believe yeah and to give to give the kiddies that healthy disorientation that we have but to then we'll be passing it on as sort of a, it'll be a creole language when they get it where it's it, we'll see how they uh, weave it into their own understanding of reality i think the four of us need to write that book so we'll start, Jeff will start. We'll take, we'll take over from there. Very exciting. So I, if you don't mind, because now we're talking about practical things, can we talk about um, micro-remediation for a minute? Happy how, to, happy, happy how, to start how, there. How, how, how real is that as a potential... I mean, I think it's very real. We we humans have been harnessing fungal metabolisms um, to break things down for us for longer than we can know. Um, think about brewing. Um, think about turning sugar into alcohol. We are recruiting fungi to break down something um, and turn it into something more desirable. Um, that's been happening in jars, um, in hollowed out logs. Um, it happens by itself, really. Um, fruit will ferment by itself that's a kind of remediation um think about all the other kinds of fermented foods that are extraordinarily ancient technologies um from lacto ferments like kimchi and um sauerkrauts and pickles to um ferments like uh, miso or, or koji um these are these are fungal metabolisms fungal and bacterial metabolisms that that we um that we are um recruiting to help us and so i think microremediation is just a special case it's a case where we are saying well look there are these problems that we've created there are these substances which have created um and we need to break them down or or help them on their way um help them transition into a different kind of um stuff um that can be less harmful to the um to the places that um we and um so many others live so um there are one way is it commonly taught about is, is by putting fungi into in polluted environments and um and there's a lot of potential there um, but it's not straightforward to just you can't just introduce a fungus to a polluted site and expect it to remediate that site by itself um it might be more effective to look for screen for local strains of fungi in the polluted site and there find fungi which are um, already well adapted to that site and find ways to boost there um, to give them more of what they need so that those fungi can do more of what they're already doing um, rather than parachuting in some kind of savior strain um, from right. the lab um, which might cause all sorts of other problems um, and um, perhaps a more effective way altogether would be to harness the technologies of fermentation that we have very very well established in industrial um, situations the industrial fermentation is a huge industry um fermenting all sorts of things uh, are there ways that we can concentrate problematic materials and have them fermented by special strains of fungi within vast fermentation facilities um and healthily broken down to um some other usable byproduct or something less toxic so that's one other way to think about it do you thank you it's fascinating isn't it i saw a potential dystopian science fiction story of the savior strain being dropped in and things go things go amiss things go awry so getting practical again about how we can move this along into society as a whole we now see things like kind of a gardening ethos um, potentially urban design also um, industry with the remediation um, and education and art in general and children's books are we missing anything of other ways to message this while 
at the same time, and I said this before, but it hasn't been addressed. Maybe we don't want to address it, but I'm just always scared of capitalism eating our gem. So I, I don't want to be so obnoxious as to be like, hey, Jeff, how do we stop capitalism from eating our gem? But Jeff, how do we stop capitalism from eating our gem? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I did. I actually addressed this in part talking about climate fiction for a piece in Esquire uh, uh, about how even that term, which is supposedly helpful, has become commodified. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's that's really what happens in, in any industry. And so you, you begin to have to push back against labels that maybe to like, for example, a general reader, they don't really see the harm in, but you as the writer have to, because otherwise you not only become commodified, you become contaminated with the narratives you don't wanna be mm. contaminated with. Um, I guess a good example for me is simply that after the Annihilation movie came out and I felt contaminated by some of the more commercial aspects of that, I wrote my most experimental and perhaps most uh, fungal book in the sense of the structure, Dead Astronauts, which was right. extremely experimental. Um, I think uh, it really is about, for me personally, it, it just has to be about examining even those foundational things that I still haven't given up that I need to, because there's so much that's, 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 that's kind of like imprinted on you, no matter how, how you try to avoid it. So for example, right now I'm doing a, a, a large chapter in this rewilding book, Wild Book, that's imagining a utopian uh, community in Florida that, that takes in mind that, you know, most of Florida is actually water. Um, uh, and and tries to imagine a way in which humans can kind of integrate uh, and the very things we're talking about this contamination that some people see as uh, between us and the world that some people see as so negative how that can be optimized as something that's actually part of how a community thinks uh, yeah. while also keeping in mind the history of, of traditions that already deal with these kinds of things um, and so uh, I think part of it for me uh, is talking about it, <laughs> um, right. laying it bare, uh, even laying it bare in this chapter I'm writing um, to kind of like make a list of the things that commodification and capitalism uh, made me have to reconsider um, in writing such a chapter. Um, but it is very, very uh, uh, difficult. Um, and to some extent, you're always operating, unfortunately now within a system, uh, even on Twitter where, you know, to some extent, I feel like I'm getting a good message out about the non-human world and our relationship to it. You're still aware that you're in an environment that's about, to some extent, selling something. Right. Um, so it's it's tough. It's definitely tough. I don't know that I really have the answer to it, except to be continually aware of it and trying to be pushing back against it. I think that is the answer to it, perhaps. Just awareness and attempts. I don't know if there's a toolkit yet for for doing that. We need to give you a little further down the road in our kind of mycelial functioning. Is there any social history lessons, Caitlin, about how to stop consumerism from eating our gem? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I, uh, I I like the framing of the question. <laughs> um, it's very hungry. <laughs> you know, I admittedly don't have any immediate reactions that are drawn directly from social history. Uh, but something that does come to mind for me as I think about what's on the horizon, um, moving into the coming decades um, and coming century uh, is just the rise of AI and um, the way in which um, that is poised to transform our societies. And I was reading an article just a couple of days ago about um, ways in which scientists are envisioning leveraging mushrooms to um, make AI technology um, more stronger, or <laughs> to make it stronger or more resilient, um, specifically using mushroom-based computer chips, um, as opposed to computer chips derived from other types of materials. And um, I mention this because whenever I think about the, the various possible futures that people um, speak of um, related to, you know, uh, a takeover by artificial intelligence or, um, you know, the singularity, I, I tend to look upon those projected futures with um, 
a lot of concern and cynicism. Um, but something that I've been so something that I've been thinking about, though, is that um, humans being put in a situation in which we have to contend with the strength and reach of a non-human intelligence that um, that we have to acknowledge and, and be in relation with, I think, is disturbing to me. But it's also um, exciting to me to consider that um, we could potentially, particularly uh, people in the global north, um, could find themselves in a situation in which we need to humble ourselves um, in the face of a mysterious universe. And um, I mention this also because I could imagine, uh, given this research that's being done, that that fungi could play a role in helping to advance those developments. And um, I don't know, it could make it seem um, it could lend, I guess, credence to um, the use of these technologies and their continued growth. Um, but perhaps um, there would be something valuable about the expansion and, um, yeah, increase in, um, uh, what is the word that I'm looking for, increased agency of, of these artificial intelligences, and it could help us relinquish this fantasy of mastery that we've sort of been talking about implicitly, this focus on control and categorization. Um, and yeah, ironically, perhaps being humbled in the face of artificial intelligence could help us um, see more clearly or, you know, be on the on the land more, more uh, with greater integrity. Thank you. That is so cogent. There's you, you brought up a thing that I've been leaving out of my lists, which is humility. And I have a new bumper sticker um, that we can use to raise funds for our children's book series. And the bumper sticker is normalize humility in the face of mystery. That's all. That's all we want. And that's what this can do. So we're coming up on time. We're actually past time a little bit, but we're having too much fun. Um, do you have any closing thoughts you want to lay upon us um, and where this is going and being humble in the face of mystery and healthy disorientation and porosity and how this will be one of those threads that weaves the future. Change is a foot, change is always a foot, but now we have um, a tendril at the table. Just want to throw in something about the last point about um, fungi and capitalism. And just, just a reminder that, that, that I have to remind myself of this all the time, that this is a kingdom of life we're talking about. So it's like saying plants or animals. There are so many ways to be a fungus. There are so many ways we relate with these organisms. There are so many things they do. Um, it's a vastly diverse kingdom of life as well. Um, so for example, think about plants, think about how plants inter inter interact with is capitalism and how they, um, you might think about the tulip mania in Holland. This is a, a, a very distilled example of, of a plant um, line uh, profiting in the sense of being propagated um, endlessly. Um, from a capitalist system by playing within a capitalist system, um, being able to persuade humans to grow it to the exclusion of other plants, um, and that plant actually um, piggybacking on a hypercapitalist system to yeah. propagate itself. So I'm sure the same would be true of fungi, and actually could be said to be true of um, fungi already. If you think about brewers' yeast, if you think about um, other types of industrially useful fungi, which are already propagated to the exclusion of other fungi in vast quantities in industrial facilities. Um, also to throw in there that, that fungi have um, probably changed our ways of social organizing in the past. Um, the Neolithic transition commonly thought of as around 12,000 years ago, but which probably took place over a, a larger period of time in a more peaceful manner. Um, it's been thought of in the past as, as, as about being about bread and um, bread and beer. And uh, historically, the bread before beer hypothesis was um, dominant among scholars, but steadily the beer before bread hypothesis has been gaining traction. And um, point is that either way, um, either in bread or as beer, we're feeding yeasts before we feed ourselves. And so in some way, you can think about the transition to agriculture as being and grains as being um, one of a closely, um, uh, oh, well, fairly rapidly evolving um, symbiosis with yeast. Um, all of the attendant changes in social order, social organizing structures, hierarchies, um, uh, social imaginaries um, arise in some sense um, from a relationship with a fungus uh, in the form of yeast. Um, and there are many other examples a bit like this that we could um, that we could think of. I, if we wanted to um, play with these different ways that Funky might help us to reconsider the ways that we organize and to um, and imagine our organizational structures. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. So fast. We need another hour just to talk about that. Clearly, like you know, my mycelium have been benefiting from our capitalism more than we have, <laughs> but there, and plants, plants also. Fascinating. Well, folks, we have to we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Um, but I hope you had a good time freewheeling. I'm glad we didn't arrive at anything, but we're leaving with more questions and maybe some more directed questions, and that will keep us um, confused and moving towards a hopeful future. And I appreciate you all sort of, you know, in Mary Oliver's words of paying attention, being astonished and telling about it. And that's the best we can do to move this forward. So thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.